Book Four, Canto Eleven, The Legend of Campbell and Telemund. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, Book Four, The Legend of Campbell and Telemund, Canto Eleven. Marinel's former wound is healed. He comes to Proteus Hall where Thames doth the Medway wed, and feasts the sea-gods all. But ah, for pity, that I have thus long left a fair lady languishing in pain, now well away that I have done such wrong, to let fair Florimel in bands remain, in bands of love, and in sad thraldom's chain, from which, unless some heavenly power her free, by miracle, not yet appearing plain, she longer yet is like captive to be, that even to think thereof, it inly pities me. Here need you to remember how erewhile unlovely Proteus, missing to his mind that virgin's love to win by wit or wile, he threw into a dungeon deep and blind, and there in chains her cruelly did bind, in hope thereby her to his bent to draw. For when as neither gifts nor graces kind her constant mind could move at all he saw, he thought her to compel by cruelty and awe. Deep in the bottom of an huge great rock the dungeon was, in which her bound he left, that neither iron bars nor brazen lock did need to guard from force or secret theft of all her lovers, which would her have reft, for walled it was with waves which raged and roared, as they the cliff in pieces would have cleft, besides ten thousand monsters foul abhorred did wait about it, gaping greasily all begored. And in the midst thereof did horror dwell, and darkness dread, that never viewed day, like to the baleful house of lowest hell, in which old sticks her aged bones alway, old sticks the grandam of the gods doth lay. There did this luckless maid seven months abide, nor ever evening saw, nor morning's ray, nor ever from the day the night descried, but thought it all one night that did no hours divide, and all this was for love of Marinel, who her despised. Ah, who would her despise? And women's love did from his heart expel, And all those joys that weak mankind entice, Natheless his pride full dearly he did prize, For of a woman's hand it was evoke, That of the wound he yet in languor lies, Nor can be cured of that cruel stroke, Which Britomart him gave, when he did her provoke. Yet far and near the nymph his mother sought, And many salves did to his sore apply, and many herbs did use. But when as naught she saw could ease his rankling malady, at last to Tryphon she for help did hie. This Tryphon is the sea-god's surgeon height, whom she besought to find some remedy, and for his pains a whistle him behight, that of a fish's shell was wrought with rare delight. So well that leech did hark to her request, and did so well employ his careful pain, that in short space his hurts he had redressed, and him restored to healthful state again, in which he long time after did remain. There with the nymph his mother, like her thrall, who saw against his will did him retain, for fear of peril, which to him mote fall, through his too venturous prowess proved over all. It fortuned then, a solemn feast was there, to all the sea-gods and their fruitful seed, in honour of the spousals which then were betwixt the Medway and the Thames agreed. Long had the Thames, as we in records read, Before that day her wooed into his bed. But the proud nymph would for no worldly meed, Nor no entreaty to his love be led, Till now at last relenting she to him was wed. So both agreed that this their bridal feast Should for the gods in Proteus' house be made, To which they all repaired, both most and least, As well which in the mighty ocean trade, As that in rivers swim, or brooks do wade, all which, not if an hundred tongues to tell, and hundred mouths, and voice of brass I had, and endless memory that mote excel in order as they came, could I recount them well. Help, therefore, O thou sacred imp of love, the nursling of Dame Memory his dear, to whom these rolls laid up in heaven above, and records of antiquity appear, to which no wit of man may come and near. Help me to tell the names of all those floods, and all those nymphs which then assembled were, to that great banquet of the watery gods, and all their sundry kinds, and all their hid abodes. First came great Neptune with his three-forked mace that rules the seas, 
and makes them rise or fall. His dewy locks did drop with brine apace, under his diadem imperial, and by his side his queen with coronal, fair Amphitrite, most divinely fair, whose ivory shoulders were uncovered all as with a robe, with her own silver hair, and decked with pearls which the Indian seas for her prepare. These marched far afore the other crew, and all the way before them as they went. Triton his trumpet shrill before them blew, for goodly triumph and great jolliment, that made the rocks to roar as they were rent, and after them the royal issue came, which of them sprung by lineal descent. First the sea-gods, which to themselves do claim the power to rule the billows, and the waves to tame. Phorcus, the father of that fatal brood, by whom those old heroes won such fame, and Glaucus, that wise soothsays understood, and tragic Inoe's son, the which became a god of seas to his mad mother's blame. Now hight Palamon, and his sailor's friend, great Brontus, and Astraeus, that did shame himself with incest of his kin unkend, and huge Orion, that doth tempest still portend. The rich Theatus and Eurytus long, Nellius and Peleus, lovely brethren both, mighty Chrysaor and Caicus strong, Eurypulus, that calms the water's wrath, and fair Euphemius, that upon them goth, as on the ground without dismay or dread, fierce Eryx, and Alebius, that knoweth the water's deep, and doth their bottom tread, and sad Asopus, comely with his hoary head. There also some most famous founders were, of precent nations, which the world possessed, yet sons of Neptune, now assembled here, ancient Ogyges, even the ancientest, and Inarchus renowned above the rest, Phoenix and Aeon and Pelasgus old, great Belus, Phoax and Agenor best, and mighty Albion, father of the bold and warlike people, which the Britain islands hold. For Albion the son of Neptune was, who for the proof of his great puissance, out of his Albion did on dry foot pass into old Gaul, that now is cleaped France, to fight with Hercules, that did advance to vanquish all the world with matchless might, and there his mortal pot by great mischance was slain, but that which is the immortal sprite lives still, and to this feast with Neptune's seed was dight. But what do I their names seek to rehearse, which all the world have with their issue filled? How can they all in this so narrow verse contained be, and in small compass hilled? Let them record them that are better skilled, and know the monuments of passed times, only what needeth shall be here fulfilled, to express some part of that great equipage, which from great Neptune do derive their parentage. Next came the aged Ocean, and his dame, old Tethys, the oldest two of all the rest, for all the rest of those two parents came, which afterward both sea and land possessed, of all which Nereus the eldest and the best did first proceed, then which none more upright, no more sincere in word and deed professed, most void of guile, most free from foul despite, doing himself, and teaching others to do right. There too he was expert in prophecies, and could the leaden of the gods unfold, through which, when Paris brought his famous prize, the fair Tyndarid lass, he him foretold, that her all Greece with many a champion bold should fetch again, and finally destroy proud Priam's town. So wise is Nereus old, and so well skilled, nevertheless he takes great joy of times amongst the wanton nymphs to sport and toy. After him the famous rivers came, which do the earth enrich and beautify, the fertile Nile, whose creatures new doth frame, Long Rhodonus, whose source springs from the sky, Fair Ister, flowing from the mountains high, Divine Scamander, purpled yet with blood Of Greeks and Trojans, which therein did die, Pactolus, glistering with his golden flood, And Tigris fierce, whose streams of none may be withstood, Great Ganges and immortal Euphrates, Deep Indus and Meander intricate, Slow Peneus, and tempestuous Phasides, swift Rene, and Alpheus still immaculate, Oraxes, feared for great Cyrus' fate, Tibris, renowned for the Romans' fame, rich Orinoki, though but known late, and that huge river which doth bear his name of warlike Amazons, which do possess the same. Joy on those warlike women, which so long can from all men so rich a kingdom hold, and shame on you, O men, who boast your strong and valiant hearts, in thoughts less hard and bold, yet quail in conquest of that land of gold. But this to you, O Britons, most pertains, to whom the right hereof itself hath sold, the which for sparing little cost or pains, lose so immortal glory, and so endless gains. 
Then was there heard a most celestial sound of dainty music, which did next ensue before the spouse that was Orion crowned, who playing on his harp unto him drew the ears and hearts of all that goodly crew, that even yet the dolphin, which him bore through the Aegean seas from pirate's view, stood still by him, astonished at his law, and all the raging seas for joy forgot to roar. So went he playing on the watery plain, soon after whom the lovely bridegroom came, the noble Thamus, with all his goodly train, but him before there went, as best became his ancient parents, namely the ancient same, but much more aged was his wife than he, the Ouz, whom men do Isis rightly name, full weak and crooked creature seemed she, and almost blind to eld, that scarce her way could see. Therefore on either side she was sustained of two small grooms, which by their names were height, the churn, and charwell, two small streams, which pained themselves her footing to direct aright, which failed oft through faint and feeble plight. But Thame was stronger, and of better stay, yet seemed full aged by his outward sight, with head all hoary, and his beard all grey, dewed with silver drops that trickled down all way and eke he somewhat seemed to stupor for with bowed back by reason of the load and ancient heavy burden which he bore of that fair city wherein make abode so many learned imps that shoot abroad and with their branches spread all brittany no less than do her elder sisters brood joy to you both ye double nursery of arts but oxford thine doth tem most glorify but he their son full fresh and jolly was all decked in a robe of watched hue, on which the waves, glittering like crystal glass, so cunningly inwoven were, that few could weenen whether they were false or true, and on his head, like to a coronet he wore, that seemed strange to common view, in which many towers and castles set, that it encompassed round as with a golden fret. Like as the mother of the gods, they say, in her great iron chariot wants to ride, when to Jove's palace she doth take her way, Old Kibberley, arrayed with pompous pride, wearing a diadem embattled wide with hundred turrets, like a turbant, which such an one was Tamis beautified, that was to weep the famous Troinorant, in which her kingdom's throne is chiefly resiant. And round about him many a pretty page attended duly, ready to obey, all little rivers which owe vassalage to him as to their lord and tribute pay, the chalky Kennet, and the Thetis Grey, the Moorish Coal, and the soft sliding breen, the wanton lee, that oft doth loose his way, and the still dallant, in whose waters clean ten thousand fishes play, and deck his pleasant stream. Then came his neighbour floods, which nigh him dwell, and water all the English soil throughout. They all on him this day attended well, and with meat service waited him about, nor at none disdained load to him lout. No, nor the stately seven grudged at all, nor storming humber, though he looked stout, but both him honoured as their principal, and let their swelling waters low before him fall. There was the speedy Tamar, which divides the Cornish and the Devonish confines, through both whose borders swiftly down it glides, and meeting Plym to Plymouth thence declines, and Dart, nigh choked with sands of tinny mines, but Avon marched in more stately path, proud of his adamants, with which he shines and glisters wide, as all's of wondrous bath and Bristow fair, which on his waves he builded hath. And there came Star, with terrible aspect, bearing his six deformed heads on high, that doth his course through Blandford plains direct, and washeth windborne meads in season dry. Next him went Willibourne, with passage sigh, that of his wiliness his name doth take, and of himself doth name the shire thereby, and Mole, that like a nursling mole doth make his way still underground, till Thomas he overtakes. Then came the rother, decked all with woods, like a wood-god, and flowing fast to rye, and stour, that parteth with his pleasant floods the eastern Saxons from the southern nigh, and Clare and Harwich both doth beautify. Him followed Yar, soft-washing Norwich wall, and with him brought a present joyfully, of his own fish unto their festival, whose like none else could show, the which they ruffins call. Next these the plenteous ooze came far from land, by many a city, and by many a town, and many rivers taking under hand into his waters as he passeth down, the Clee, the Weir, the Grant, the Store, the Rhone, thence doth by Huntingdon and Cambridge flit, my mother Cambridge, whom as with a crown he doth adorn, and is adorned of it, with many a gentle muse, and many a learned wit. And after him the fatal Welland went, 
that if old saws prove true, which God forbid, shall drown all Holland with his excrement, and shall see Stamford, though now homely hid, then shine in learning more than ever did Cambridge or Oxford, England's goodly beams, and next to him the neem down softly slid, and bounteous Trent, that in himself enseems both thirty sorts of fish, and thirty sundry streams. Next these came Tyne, along whose stony bank that Roman monarch built a brazen wall, which mote the feebled Britons strongly flank against the pits that swarmed over all, which yet thereof Golseva they do call, and Tweed the limit between Logris land and Albany, and Eden, though but small, yet often stained with blood of many a band of Scots and English both, that Tyne on his strand. Then came those six sad brethren, like forlorn, that while on were, as antique fathers tell, six valiant knights, of one fair nymph y born, which did in noble deeds of arms excel, and wandered there, where now York people dwell, still your swift worth, and oaths the most of might, high swale, unquiet nigh, and troublous skell, all whom a Scythian king that humber height slew cruelly, and in the river drowned quite. But passed not long, ere Brutus' warlike son, Loquinus them avenged, and the same date which the proud Humber unto them had done by equal dome repaid on his own pate, for in the self same river, where he late had drenched them, he drowned him again, and named the river of his wretched fate, whose bad condition yet it doth retain, oft tossed with storms, which therein still remain. These after came the stony shallow lone, that to old Lancaster his name doth lend, and following thee, which Britons long egone did call divine, that doth by Chester tend, and Conway, which out of his streams doth send plenty of pearls to deck his dames withal, and Lindus, that his pikes doth most commend, of which the ancient Lincoln men do call. All these together marched towards Proteus Hall. Now thence the Irish river's absence were, sith no less famous than the rest they be, and join in neighbourhood of kingdoms near. Why should they not likewise in love agree, and joy likewise this solemn day to see? They saw it all, and present were in place, though I them all according to their degree cannot recount, nor tell their hidden race, nor read the salvage, cutled trays through which they pace. There was the Liffey rolling down the lee, the sandy slain, the stony Obrian, the spacious Shenan spreading like a sea, the pleasant Boyne, the fishy, fruitful Ban, swift Ornidoff, which of the Englishman is called black water, and the Liffer deep, sad Troas that once his people overran, Strong aloe, toming from Sluloga steep, and Muller mine, whose waves I wallum taught to weep. And there the three renowned brethren were, of which that great giant Blomius begot, of the fair nymph Rusa, wandering there one day, as she to shun the season what, under slew bloom in shady grove was got. This giant found her, and by force deflowered, whereof conceiving, she in time brought forth these three fair sons being thence forth powered in three great rivers ran and many countries scarred the first the gentle sure that making way by sweet clonmel adorns rich waterford the next the stubborn newer whose waters grey by fair kilkenny and rothpond board the third the goodly barrow which doth hoard great heaps of salmons in his deep bosom all which long sundered do at last accord to join in one ere to the sea they come so flowing all from one all one at last become there also was the wide embayed mare, the pleasant bandon crowned with many a wood, the spreading lee that like an island fair encloseth cork with his divided flood, and baleful oar, late stained with English blood, with many more whose names no tongue can tell, all which that day in order seemly good, did on the Thomas attend, and waited well to do their dewful service as to them befell. Then came the bride, the lovely Medua came, clad in a vesture of unknown gear, and uncouth fashion, yet her well became, that steamed like silver, sprinkled here and there with glittering spangs, that did like stars appear, and waved upon, like water chamelot, to hide the metal, which yet everywhere bewrayed itself, to let men plainly what it was no mortal work, that seemed, and yet was not. Her goodly locks adown her back did flow unto her waist, with flowers bescattered, the which ambrosial odours forth did throw to all about, and all her shoulders spread as a new spring, and likewise on her head a chaplet of sundry flowers she wore, from under which the dewy humour shed, did trickle down her hair, like to the hoar, congealed little drops, which do the morn adore. 
On her two pretty handmaids did attend, One called the Thais, the other called the Crane, Which on her waited, things amiss to mend, And both behind upheld her spreading train, Under the which her feet appeared plain, Her silver feet, fair washed against this day. And her before there paced pages twain, Both clad in colours like, and like array, The Dune and eke the Frith, both which prepared her way. And after these the sea-nymphs marched all, All goodly damsels, decked with long green hair, Whom of their sire Nereides men call. All which the ocean's daughter to him bare, The grey-eyed Doris, all which fifty are, All which she there on her attending had, Swift Proto, mild Eucrati, Thetis fair, Soft Spear, sweet Eudori, Sire sad, light Doto, wanton Glauchy, And Galini glad. White hand Unica, proud Dynamini, joyous Thalia, goodly Amphitrite, lovely Pasisae, kind Eulimini, lift good Chemothoe, and sweet Melite, fairest Ferusa, foul lily white, wandered Agrave, Poris and Nisea, with Erato that doth in love delight, and Panopai, and wise Protomedea, and snowy necked Doris, and milk white Galathea. Speedy Hippothoe and chaste Actea, large Lysianessa and Pronea sage, Evagoi and light Pontoperea, and she that with her least word can assuage the surging seas when they do sorest rage, Camudoki and stout Autonoe, and Niso and Aeone well in age, and seeming still to smile, Glauconome, and she that height of many heasts, Polynome. Fresh Alameda decked with girl and green, Hyponeo, with salt bedewed rests, Laomedea, like the crystal sheen, the Agore, much praised for wise behests, and Samanthe, for her broad snowy breasts, Chimo, Eupompe, and Themiste just, and she that virtue loves and vice detests, Ivana, and Menippe, true in trust, and Nemetia, learned well to rule her lust. All these the daughters of old Nereus were, which have the sea in charge to them assigned, to rule his tides, and surges to uprear, To bring forth storms, or fast them to upbind, And sailors save from wrecks of wrathful wind. And yet besides, three thousand more there were, Of ocean's seed, but Jove's and Phoebus' kind, The which in floods and fountains do appear, And all mankind do nourish with their waters clear. The which, more eath it were for mortal wight, To tell the sands, or count the stars on high, or aught more hard than think to reckon right. But well I wot that these which I descry were present at this great solemnity, and there amongst the rest the mother was, of luckless Marinel, Kimodoki, which, for my muse herself now tired has, unto another canto I will overpass. End of Canto 11, Book 4, The Legend of Campbell and Telemond.